Good evening, church, here and at home. Uh, we will begin our liturgy in just a few moments um, with some silent prayer. Uh, this is the most difficult and solemn day in our church year as we contemplate the great passion of Christ. And I thank you all for offering your prayer. Blessed be our God. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearer is, is silent, he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. And who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering, offspring and sh shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish we shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made the intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Judas said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again Jesus asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out 
and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? Are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves of the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Those who were standing near the fire asked him, you are not also one of Jesus' disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with Jesus? Again Peter denied it. And at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus and Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against it, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, king of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests of the police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. 
Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. And therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets, him, sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's fence at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Please stand. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, worn in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus knew that all was now finished. He said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, 
They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jews, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, and so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. We preach a gospel of love here every week, whether I do it or Deacon Scott or a lay person or a bishop. We hear about God's love. We also hear about the people of God and the way that they express their love and live up to the challenges of our lives. We hear stories about Mary and Joseph saying yes to God's crazy plan that Jesus, the Son of God, would be born to this virgin and this older man who suddenly found himself in such an important role. We hear stories about Peter, Andrew, James, and John who just leave their nets and follow Jesus, hearing the call of God. We hear stories of a loving woman anointing the feet of Jesus, meeting God's call to love by kneeling down and ministering to him. We encounter that loving reaction in Mary Magdalene when she says, Rabboni, at the sight of Jesus at the tomb when she suddenly recognizes him. There are so many stories of God and the people of God responding positively in love. But if those were the only stories we told, then we'd be missing something. Because love can also be painful. The confirmation class uh, has been studying different ethical systems and Christian ethics and all of that. And, uh, and we spent some time looking at hedonism, which 
you know, most of us think as, you know, the, the people who just like to party all the time. And that is, those are hedonists, but the group that has actually been more influential in that philosophy have been those not who seek the most joy, but those, and just as important, a tenant of, of their philosophy, how to avoid pain. And you see this borne out in a whole host of different ways. I've known so many people in my life who hate their job, but won't leave it because they're afraid of what that might mean. It might mean a big change. It might mean less money, less prestige. What would a new job look like? I have known so many people over the years who hate their housing situation but are too afraid to move because moving could be hard. And in fact, I will say, it's really hard. <laughs> I've known so many people who feel lonely and want to have a connection with someone else, but they're afraid that they could get hurt again and they'd rather not put themselves out there. There are so many examples of people who know that they have to change, but that change sounds too difficult and it's too scary. So they try to avoid the pain. But love has to embrace that difficulty. And Jesus was not afraid to do it. Now it's a misreading of our scripture to say, to read it like God is some kind of uh, abusive father, you know, and wanted all of these terrible things. Or that Jesus is a masochist. Or that this is some kind of like bro challenge where it's like, see what I can take, all of this terrible suffering, and I'm stronger than it. None of that is true. That is not what is going on with the crucifixion. Jesus is love. And he did everything in his power to show that love. He taught people. He healed people. He brought people back to life. He encouraged people to do the hard thing, to change their lives, to repent, to live differently. That more was possible for them than they could ever have imagined. All of that he taught. And how did humanity react? With mistrust, with threats with plots, and with violence. Jesus is the suffering servant. These suffering servant songs were written by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years earlier. And they were written about Israel. But Jesus here is stepping in, representing Israel and the people of God. So it's both about a community and about an individual. Isaiah writes, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. For the love that he gave, he was persecuted, tortured, and crucified. And because of that, his face is marred, and it's hard to look at. So people turned away. They turned away out of guilt. 
we did that. We caused that pain on this poor man. Jesus could have made a big show of the trial, if you want to call it that, that we heard about just a few minutes ago. He could have humiliated Pilate by his wisdom and erudition that we had seen many times in the scriptures. And others had done it. There's probably not a person who was a college freshman who did not read the great apology of Socrates. And Socrates, uh, when he was accused of some of those same things that Jesus was, um, gave a, a, a passionate speech and questioned those who were bringing these charges against them. But Jesus did not do that. Isaiah writes, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. By staying silent, Jesus shows to everyone the corruption of the world because it's only their actions that are there. He doesn't say anything. So we all get to see what an evil thing this was that they did. Jesus gave humanity love and humanity responded with evil. He meets betrayal, abandonment, deceit, injustice, abuse, and torture with love. From the cross he says things like, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In Luke's gospel, he comforts one of his fellow uh, convicted uh, of a capital crime, a prisoner, if you'd like to call him that. In St. John's gospel, as we've just heard, as he is nearly dead, on the cross, he thinks of his mother and his beloved John. Even then, he's thinking of others and loving. Humanity gave everything that it had to try to smother him out, to try to change who Jesus was, and he didn't. They couldn't take that away. And we shouldn't be surprised because at the beginning of John's Gospel, we hear that Jesus is the light and the darkness could not overcome it. So not being able to change Jesus and get him to meet hatred for their hatred and evil for their evil, they kill him. Though as we know, that does not extinguish the light. Mary, the mother of Jesus, I, I think comes off uh, the best of the rest of humanity in this story. She, too, represents an Old Testament figure. She represents the daughter of Zion from uh, the Book of Lamentations. And as we uh, prayed earlier today on our Stations of the Cross liturgy, we quote Lamentations and say, All you who pass by, behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. My eyes are spent with weeping, 
My soul is in tumult. My heart is poured out in grief because of the downfall of my people. The virgin daughter of Zion is witnessing the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and its beloved temple. This new virgin daughter of Zion, Mary, is representing, is witnessing the destruction of her people and her son and this holy temple of Christ's very body. And she weeps bitterly. She remembered, no doubt, that Simeon, the prophet that we meet at Candlemas, the Feast of the Presentation, 40 days after Jesus was born. She goes into the temple with Joseph, and Simeon is there. And Simeon is the first one who says that this Jesus is the suffering servant. He doesn't put it that way. That'd be a downer. Um, he, he quotes it, though, and says, he is going to be a light to enlighten the Gentiles. But then he whispers to Mary, but a sword will pierce your own soul, too. Her love will cost her something. That does not mean that the lesson should be don't love, but love can hurt. Love and sin can bring us to the same lesson. Sin can show our brokenness and how we've messed things up and how we need God to help change. Love may make us realize how much we love God and how much we need God. And there are also times when love, our love hurts us, maybe because we have to say goodbye to someone that we love dearly. And we need God's help and healing that only the God and creator of time can help us with. God always gets the last word. And a funny thing about God being outside of time, sometimes he gets the last word first. The beginning of this song of the suffering servant reads, see my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. That's a heck of a way to start this poem about someone who is suffering, beaten, crucified. But this is how it begins. Because the man of sorrow will ultimately prosper and be lifted up, will be glorified, as St. John likes to say. God gets the last word. God has the power to create and recreate. God has the power to resurrect and to wipe away every tear. And God has the power to find what has been lost and the power to save us all. Good Friday is a good day to say, I could use some saving. So if it's because of our love or our sin or most likely a mix of all of that, we need you, Christ, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray therefore for people everywhere according to their needs. <coughs> Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Jeffrey and Laura, our bishops, and for all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's grace they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, Kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and for those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others 
that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We will now take a time to venerate the cross. I know this is new for some folks, uh, so what we will do is we will say uh, three uh, or, or one versicle three times. It's probably familiar to most of you. Um, I will say, we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. And the response is, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. So I'll do that three times as uh, Deacon Scott uh, lifts the veil of the crucifix. Uh, then you are invited to forward, if you so choose, uh, to venerate the cross. The most traditional way of doing that you'll still find in many Eastern Orthodox churches with uh, people prostrating themselves and then going up to kiss the cross. If you'd like to just stay where you are, that is perfectly fine. This is all about your own personal piety, um, but anything in between that is also welcome. Some people just come up to the uh, altar rail and say some prayers, and you certainly may go all, go all the way up to the cross and give it a kiss or, or touch it. That is, that is up to you. Um, and today, uh, our wonderful choir is going to be singing uh, during the first part of that veneration. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <coughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray in the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, give you an everlasting life.
Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 